Hello everybody, welcome to Lee Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Lee Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host Mark Fusker here for a special edition show. I'm here with Ian Birch, winemaker here at Archery Summit. And uh, we just uh, had a good time going out to the vineyards. It's like 35 degrees out, no lie. I checked my watch when I had to go get the mount. So it means it was actually colder. <laughs> I don't have frostbite, but my fingers were cold after flying the drone. I was a little concerned that we, it would be too windy. Um, he actually saw the wind, high wind warning, but that's only because I took the drone really high and it was a little windy. Uh, but I got some amazing drone footage. Uh, we walked through the winery, kind of talked about some stuff. So before I keep talking, Ian, why don't you introduce yourself? How did you get over here? What, what, what made you want to do wine? Well, thanks for uh, taking the time to, to come to Archery Summit. Uh, yeah. We're actually in our cave right now, underneath the winery itself. Um, Archery Summit was always one of those wineries that yeah, I, I saw from a distance. Uh, I used to come and you know, check out what Anna Metzinger was doing here, and I had a, a lot of respect for the program. Yeah. We just had our 25th anniversary, and yeah, I was looking to make a change a couple years ago, and Nicholas Kie came on board here as COO, and I had uh, worked with him previously, and he's one of those people that you want to be close to because you can learn a lot from. And yes. I think when you couple that with our vineyard manager being in Dundee for 37 years, having uh, five vineyards that you know, only we get fruit from, it's a, it's, a, it's a very special sort of combination, not to mention you know, all this incredible uh, equipment upstairs, mm -hmm. all these uh, concrete fermenters, wooden fermenters, and stainless steel fermenters and uh yeah the people on the ground here with hospitality you know moving people through selling wine uh you just kind of get a sense of of it all and it's just a, it's really cool to step into a place that has been growing and thriving for years and you get to kind of grab the steering wheel and and help steer it some yeah you said it was a good fit right it was like you had a little you have a little, you want to tell that little funny story about how you yeah, got so, here yeah yeah like so with, with nicholas so he and i had worked briefly together we're thinking about making some wine with him he started up a facility up in washington called vidmotion mm -hmm. and you know we we're just kind of talking together uh, my old the old president of my previous company was friends with him and you know we sat down and went through some blendings and stuff and i realized very quickly that this guy knows far more than I do. He's got his master of wine. Mm -hmm. I believe he's got a double MBA. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it, we're talking one day and, you know, I was talking about you know, some, something I was dealing with and he's like, yeah, sometimes it's not, it's not about knowing everything. It's just knowing a little bit more than the person sitting across from you. Yeah. So I was like, hey, you know, it's pretty, pretty accurate. It's pretty wise. So I saw that he got the job as COO for the Crimson Wine Group and, I texted him, you know, congratulations. And he said, you know, there's big shoes to fill. And he said, you're the right guy for it. And I quoted him, you yeah. know, and it's like, ha, ha, ha. So the next day I get a text from him. And yeah, he had texted me accidentally asking me to go to a, like a ball game or watch a ball game. And I had noticed earlier that day that they were hiring a winemaker at Archery Summit. So I wrote back like, hey, I think you got the wrong Ian. <laughs> but I also see you guys are hiring a winemaker and he said, hey, I'd love to talk to you about that because I think you'd be a great fit. Yeah. So it happened semi-organically and, you know, I'm, I'm all about the people here. I mean, it's, it's all about people for me. It yeah. always has been and always will be. You know, the work is there. We all know that we have to do a good job. Yeah. About making sure that people are empowered and happy and challenged and rewarded right you know it, it makes a big difference and i could tell that you know, nicholas is uh, kind but he also expects a certain amount mm -hmm. and he's easy to respect too because he's in the trenches and he's looking at everything line by line right yeah yeah great guy to work with yeah i meant to tell you that i had a somewhat similar story it didn't it didn't come up with as much success as yours but um after i left morton's i went to another job and um uh I, someone I knew from a prior 
like uh, job. I didn't really work directly with him, but I worked with him enough that I kind of got a good feeling about him. Uh, he got a, new, a job in a private club in San Antonio, and I sent him a little congratulations note. And he's like, hey, I just happened to be looking for someone to be a food and beverage director. Do you know anybody? I said, well, I might be <laughs> interested in this. And we sat down, talked. It felt like a good fit, at least on a professional level, um, you know, with, with working with him. And I thought it would be a good progression in my career. Unfortunately, it didn't work out the club-wise. I mean, with him, it was utmost respect for this gentleman right like if he had something else going on that would be i felt would be a good fit i would totally totally work for him again because i think he's amazing to work for um but it's just the situation wasn't a good situation for me right but that's fine you know i oh, now, yeah. you know I, I gave it a shot and it didn't work out but i'm in a happy place now so <laughs> I have, I have to say so too <laughs> exactly yeah. but um so kind of talk about Archer Summit. How did they get started? And, and kind of tell me the history about them. So Gary Andrus, mm -hmm. this is his brainchild. Like we're still sitting in like, I, I'd say probably what his dream had started with. So okay. he started Pine Ridge in 1978. And Just a little winery down there in California. In you know, whatever. It's in the heart <laughs> of Napa Valley. They make a couple of wines, you know. Whatever. Yeah. It's okay stuff. <laughs> you know, he, he, did a, he did an incredible job there. You know, nice cave system, um, fantastic wines. It got a number of great scores, and I think his his uh, his mind was on Oregon, so he rallied some investors, and in 1993 they broke ground here, set up the winery, um, kind of going for like the faux chateau look. Okay, so like yeah. when you look at Archery Summit now, it does it's like oh yeah of course it, it looks like a, it was modeled after you know French chateau, and he did that because he was really obsessed with what Oregon can do in relation to Burgundy. Mm -hmm. He's a big Burgundy buff. Um, I don't know, you know, making cabs in Napa, I think maybe like that was his first calling, but maybe secretly he had this affinity to Pinot Noir. Okay. And yeah, he came into Oregon, um, you know, Oregon started with the Lats back in 1965, actually right down the street. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Dundee was still growing and emerging but it definitely had some traction by then but I, I do consider him to kind of be like one of the the more let's say influential people in regards to just like this is Oregon and we're going to invest a lot into it okay you know we're going to put it in a cave system we're going to have state-of-the-art equipment so we had Sam Tannehill um, come over to work with him who now uh, owns and runs Rex Hill and A to Z mm -hmm. and I think with the help of Sam they got this project off the ground. Um, you know, we have very iconic sites in the Dundee Hills. Arcus kind of being our flagship. Um, so Arcus and, and Red Hills have definitely put us on the map. And then we're underneath Summit Vineyard mm -hmm. and Renegade and Archer's Edge. So a combination of all five of those kind of make us what we are. Right. Um, 105 acres in the Dundee Hills. And what I consider to be, you know, some... It's a pretty enticing real estate for people. I think people look at Dundee still to this day yeah. as like a, a really sort of trustworthy, uh, tasty, reliable, and you know also coming up with some really compelling Pinot Noirs. Yeah, I can tell you that in my travels here, um, I've obviously been in this area a lot, a lot of different days. I've just been you know kind of hitting this there and there, but a lot of the rock star wineries are based here. Not, not to say that I haven't gone to Rockstar wineries outside of Dundee, but, um, you know, and, and that's, I've gone to a lot of really cool wineries, you know, everywhere in Aeola, you know, uh, where I, in Ribbon Ridge, uh, Shehalem. I mean, there's, there's definitely some rock stars everywhere where there was an interview or just a tasting that I went to, but, um, there seems to be like a collection uh, really, and it's just like Dundee keeps coming up right. as like the place where a lot of premium sites are. Even mm -hmm. if it's not, even if the winery's not there, they're getting people are getting grapes from this area. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and the wines, I feel like they are very uh, reliable. Like you, when you taste something from Dundee, like you get it. Like they're yeah. silky, they're red or fruited. You know, we we're talking earlier about yeah, you know, my, my, my past, I, I've done a lot of work in Eola Amity. Mm -hmm. Um, I used to work at Evening Land Vineyards at Seven Springs and the fruit profile there, although we're both on volcanic soil, the fruit profile there is so different than Dundee. And I worked with marsh fruit before I came on board here. So I think I had a good sense of like what Dundee could offer, yeah. especially considering that marsh is right next door to Arcus. Mm -hmm. But 
there's definitely, um, yeah, I'd say, a characteristic here that you don't get anywhere else, like in Ribbon Ridge or Shehalem, mm -hmm. um, other two other areas that I've worked with in the past. Yeah. And yeah, it's it's been a lot of fun to like learn and figure out like how much we can take and you know what the fruit does here. Right. Exactly. So um, we went up. Uh, oh, we, we saw it through the rest of the history. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah. Before we keep going, yeah. So the rest of the history so, of this. Yeah. I mean, we just had our 25th anniversary. Yeah. Um, we've always been known for our Pinot Noirs, and we've just sort of embarked onto the Chardonnay train. Okay. So we have some fruit that came off the bottom of the site here at Summit mm -hmm. with our Dundee Hills uh, Chardonnay, and we planted uh, a handful of other acres at uh, Red Hills and Renegade Ridge. So we're, we're starting to get into the, the Chardonnay groove, but we've always been known for the Pinot Noirs that we produce. And I think historically, Gary had to been a little bit more extractive. There's been a lot more like new oak nuance to the wines. Okay. And I think as we've moved forward with Sam Tannehill, uh, who worked at Domaine Darlo and incorporated a lot of whole cluster, um, Anna Metzinger maybe taking a, a foot off the gas with whole cluster, maybe also not using as much new oak to Chris Mays Pink, who began, I don't want to say feminizing the wines. Um, it's easy for me to see that because I, uh, I, I spent a lot of time in Burgundy in France. Right, so they have a lot of that masculine feminine exactly. analogy, yeah. But I would say the, the wines like now are, are fresher. Um, I feel like we know that there's a nice concentration in the vineyard. And I think we're, I'd say right now I'm reanalyzing exactly what sort of oak nuances we need. Okay. Um, I think the fruit has a lot to say, but I think because there was a little bit more uh, oak use in the very beginning of this brand, those wines are hanging on so well. Yeah. And we've got a tremendous library uh, stacked up underneath us. Nice. So. I just feel like, yeah, in, in terms of Oregon, you know, it was sort of the glitzy new thing back in 1993. And now I feel like we're, uh, we're more approachable. Um, you know, anybody can come, you know, we're more inclusive than exclusive. Okay. And you know, there's a really strong sense of community right now from, you know, our, our venue management team, you know, coming over like last Friday, production, uh, cooked them a bunch of food from nice. scratch. And just saying, like, you guys are a bunch of badasses. <laughs> Thanks for busting your butts. You yeah. know, like, we, we love everything you do. And hospitality, you know, we're always sort of moving around each other, you know, helping them with events and, you know, having people come in and you know, really seeing what we do here. So I, I think there's an element of, uh, of community and friendship and really enjoying the people you work with. Nice. So we really try to maintain healthy relationships with one another and communicate and, uh, yeah, I think that's just something that's keep continuing to kind of keep this legacy healthy and alive here at Archery Summit. Very nice. So when we got started, um, I kind of met you down in one of the winery. Where, where were we at? I don't really. That's where we keep a lot of our, like, our bottled goods. Okay, yeah. So I met you over there, and then we kind of we, we talked about where we were going to do the drone footage. And instead of going back up to the tasting room, you said this comes through the caves. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, um, so kind of describe the cave system. Uh, I took a couple pictures, um, but kind of describe the cave system. We'll get back to that later because <laughs> oh, that's yeah. cool, right? Totally. Um, so don't let me forget that. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, kind of tell me about the cave system, how it, how it was built, and just, yeah, just tell me about it. We're very unique uh, in Oregon. Yeah. I mean, we're we're the only cave, natural cave, like drilled out cave system. Uh, we've got one quarter of a mile. And you know we're we're nerdy internally here. We've got like A cave, B cave, and C cave. <laughs> I remember my first day just walking around. You know, there's some doors that connect caves to one another. Okay. And we're like whipping through this one and that one. And I mean, we got to the point where I had no idea where I was and how to get out. But it doesn't take long to figure out. But it's <laughs> lovely, and just in terms of temperature, I think when you're above ground, you're running um, air conditioning or heating. But mm -hmm. to know that you've got the same temperature all the time is it's a luxury yeah. I mean, we've got wines uh in our cave c storage room that date back to the early 90s and some of these that have been above ground and been moving around from warehouse to warehouse you'll pop one open one's good one's okay you know one maybe has a funky cork yeah but nearly every wine that stays in that cave 
in that cave room because it's at a constant temperature is just exquisite. It's crazy. Yeah. So I look at the barrels the same way. They're not going through any sort of temperature differential. They don't gobble through free sulfur. Um, the wines are able to mature at a nice constant rate. And because we have a decent humidity here, we're not having to top all the time. Right. So we don't get a lot of evapotranspiration. And you know, that's great for any winemaker. It's great for the bottom line. Yeah. Because you don't have product floating into, into the air. Oh yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, this is similar to my Burgundy trip, you know, uh, I didn't go into a lot of caves, but the places I did, they always have, almost always had underground storage. Uh, a few of them didn't just because of how they were built, built. but yeah, I mean, um, the only thing different is I don't see any black, I don't see any black mold. To I know, right? <laughs> it's so funny, especially too, because a lot of, a lot of Burgundian producers like won't put labels or capsules on stuff until yeah. they get an order. And then they'll like, they'll run it through. So those bottles that have like mold on them or whatever. Yeah, they go through clean the them washer. Off and, yeah, they just have a little, they just have a little chalk boards and they just have like a number in this, their internal system. They know what that wine is right. and where it came from in the year. Um, yeah, so I went to Bouchard, um, Perifis, not Anifis, Bouchard, Perifis. Um, yeah, we're down the, in the, yeah, oh my God. Um, we're down in the cellar and then um, uh, my viewers, if they've been watching since two, two years ago, they know the story, but I'm gonna tell you the story. Um, so we're doing it and this lady, the lady who was helping me out, uh, was giving me the tour. Uh, she, she points down this hallway and she goes, well, that's where we keep all the old stuff. I was like, okay, cool. And uh, she goes, you know what? You, you've traveled pretty far. Let me see if we can go get the key for my colleague because he had it earlier. So let me see if we can get it. So she gets it. We go into that, we go into the room. It's like the inner sanctum. Whoa. These are things from the 1800s. Wow. No, we didn't pull any out and taste, but that would have been epic. Right. Um, I learned what happens with wines that old, that they actually, every 30, 40 years, they take the cork out, they test all the wines, and whatever's bad, they get rid of, what's ever good, they fill things back up, put brand new corks in them. So that's why you could have an old wine and right. still have a, a pretty good cork. Um, but, you know, it's just it's just dusty and all that. And um, uh, so, we're, so we hear people outside, pretty far down the, down the, the hall or the cave, and so we're done. We walk out. And uh, as we're walking out, they're walking in. I was like, hmm. So we get pretty far down the cave. And they're like, so if we hadn't been in there, would they have gone in there? She goes, no. Just because the door was open, the person who was giving that, it was like a group, of a group tour, put him in there. And I was like, as so I turned to the camera, I was like, so if you're part of that group, you uh. thank me because you got to go to the inner sanctum. So yeah, I mean, it was pretty amazing to go through all that. Yeah, um, it's so know. elaborate too. I mean, yeah. especially when you look at like the town of Bone and then you realize like how much, you know, of a network there is like underneath underground feet yeah. all the time. It's like, wow. Yeah, yeah. It, it was pretty amazing. Um, so we walked through the cave system. Uh, so we're, um, since we're kind of on the subject, uh, we'll, again, we'll get to that later. Um, but what is this little room that we're in now? So we're in the A-list lounge. So yeah. we have a club and, you know, when people join the club, they're allowed to do special seated tastings here with their friends. And, you know, we'll deck this room out for, you know, holidays. Uh, a lot of people come and, you know, rent it out for, you know, either like a holiday party or like a wedding. Okay. And, yeah, we take all the furniture out, put a, a long table in, and it's absolutely lovely. Hey, just, you don't get to go into a cave every day. Exactly. It feels really good. You do. But I, I do. <laughs> yeah. So I like kind of look pasty. It yeah. kind of like look like a vampire. Just I, know, I, I, tried to, I tried to make the exposure not so bad because I, I, I won't say exactly how I said Mid it. Thing. But Sorry I was going. like, man, it was like, oh, I'm, I'm definitely way overexposed. <laughs> but I tried to, I, tried, I mean, I guess I could have turned out the intensity. It's what light, we call the cave effect. The cave effect, yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's definitely a special room, you know. Yeah. It's, it's, it's well lit. Um, it's really comfortable. And, you know, we have our barrels just on the outside of it mm -hmm. that people get to walk through. Yeah. And it, it's, it, it's one of those places that people, uh, maybe if they would live in Oregon, and they didn't realize was here, they're always like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I haven't come here sooner. Right. And we see a lot of people come back because they want to bring their friends and our hospitality is very good at taking care of people. Yeah, I met a couple of them, uh, a couple of people from the team and they were setting up, they were setting up something else, like I guess a tasting later yeah, on, exactly. another part of the cave. Yep. Yeah, so that's awesome. So um, then we went to the winery, I met a couple of interns. That's uh, right. They, where are they from? So we've got one from New Zealand this year, mm -hmm. uh, Lawrence, who's, uh, he's, he's has his head down. He works his tail off and, you know, he, he interviewed, we, we get a number of applicants, um, this year, Corey, my associate, 
uh, screened everybody and you know brought these two guys on. Um, we also have Simon, yeah. who's uh, from Germany, and mm -hmm. it's funny. Um, he's part of the WhatsApp generation, so his sister, who's kind of holding down the the hatch right now at home, yeah, for him, sends him messages, and you can see he's just like. You know, just sort of like <laughs> listening to see, like, okay, everything's okay. We, yeah. we ask him, like, hey, how's harvest going for you? I think uh, it's probably a little difficult for him to be away, but, yeah. you know, they're both, gosh, they're both, like, you know, relatively young. Mm -hmm. So having that sort of enthusiasm and also that know-how, you know, right. it's, it's fine working with people that haven't been in the industry. You know, we like to teach uh, because I feel like when you teach somebody something, it makes you smarter. It makes you have to exactly really sort of pick apart everything you know so that you can communicate it effectively. But with those two, and we had Matt return from last year, who's a local, okay, who kind of uh, runs our sorting line and keeps everybody happy out there, and uh, our enologist Anthony and mm -hmm. Brandon, our seller master, yeah. you met, and Corey. Um, we had uh, we had the 18 this year. Nice, probably the smoothest harvest I've ever had. And Very cool. It's yeah, it's it's largely to do with all of them. All right. Yeah. So and then after that, we we went up into the vineyards, um, and so kind of, so this will be a good spot for me to start showing the footage. Um, so kind of tell me, we walked up to the top of the hill. So tell me what vineyard that is and kind of the significance of it. Right. So that's Summit Vineyard. So mm -hmm. it's a 16-acre vineyard. Um, the winery sits on it. We're underneath it. So we have some old suitcase clones that Gary <laughs> Andrus bought over from Burgundy years mm -hmm. ago. And we just, we call them Archery Summit clones. Okay. And, you know, it, I'm, I've been learning more and more about these things. Um, it's just, it's a lot when people, it cracks me up when people ask you what clone is, especially from a consumer perspective, because I feel like stylistically, you can change the way a clone behaves. Yeah. You can overcrop it, you can undercrop it, you can over extract it, you can put tons of oak on it. But I think when you eliminate all those factors, and like you put on your nerd helmet as a winemaker and you look at all these beautiful blocks that you have to work with. You know, we have approximately 85 different blocks mm -hmm. and 105 acres. Yeah. So there's a crazy amount of diversity. And at Summit, I feel like this vineyard is the briniest vineyard we have. Um, there is an, an extreme uh, level of potassium, okay, which I feel like adds to that sort of uh, briny effect. It's almost like an electrolyte. Okay. And you couple that with like this high iron soil. I think the, the iron adds like almost like a bloodiness to the wines. Like there's like this ferric sort of metallic nature to them. So I think when you couple those two together, Summit in my mind tends to be, you know, sort of the, the standout in the crowd. Um, we have two other vineyards that you probably caught the side of Renegade right. Ridge, which is adjacent to Summit, mm -hmm. and then Archer's Edge, which is on the bottom of the road. Okay. And so that's where I, when I did the drone coming up from the bottom. Actually, I don't think I got, I think I was, I think I was in front of that vineyard. I think I, so. I don't think I actually got all the way down there. Right. But yeah, I mean, I, there's a shot of me going down there. So hopefully I have that. So Maybe you can see that. But the then when I did the, when I did the more, the, the quote beauty shot, I guess, when I did, made the camera point up. My drone is the only drone that can do that, by the way. Uh. Not my <laughs> own drone, but that, 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 that model drone is one of the only drones that can have the camera shoot up. And that's why I did that. So I could like take that shot. It's but cool. so, but so it was probably, it was behind that, right? Okay, definitely. Cool. Um, so let's let's go ahead and maybe start doing some wines. I think yeah, we've kind of that described great. some stuff. Then we can keep talking about some other things. So, uh, so what are we going to start with? I'd, I'd like to start with Arcus. Okay. So this is a 2016 vintage. Um, right. It's had a, it's had some time to incorporate. We're on the very tail end of it, and I thought it'd be fun to pour something for you that you know we're we're almost done with. That's in excellent tasting shape. Okay. And then we're going to get into a Dundee Hill blend, and then uh, our Chardonnay. All right, cool. Which I love to talk about. Um, Very nice. Yeah. So Arcus is, Arcus is an iconic vineyard. I think uh, when you when you mentioned Arcus in Oregon, I think people people know what the site is. They know what it's all about. Um, it's a drastic bowl. So you've got west facing, south facing, east facing, and you have a plethora of of different rootstock, clone, vine age. And it's our rockiest site, okay. unlike Red Hills, which is a lot deeper. Summit here is also has a deeper profile too. Arcus tends to be, I'd say, more intellectual than our other Pinot Noirs. This is also one that we have um, in distribution as well as we pour in the tasting room. But 
we feel like this is uh this is definitely a wine that kind of says who we are mm -hmm. and it kind of pulls people in yeah um you know i get really great i get a lot of darker fruit to it definitely. you know you get that so just like every pinot it's gonna have cherry so i shouldn't have to like say cherry every single time but is there's darker fruits in this more but actually a darker cherry um a little bit maybe a little bit of a black blackberry type of thing but very juicy um very very uh i won't say fruit forward but the fruit is definitely making its making its presence known for sure yeah it's not like a fruit forward like high you know heavy fruit forward like cab or something like that but yeah it's definitely got some good fruit to it and it's um it's definitely ready to party right <laughs> i think it's just it's like it's, it's fresh the, it's fresh it's juicy yeah yeah and i i feel like it's it's just sort of like saying hey i'm here like drink me now like yeah this is definitely a wine that we encourage people to to lay down our arcasis is all of them uh, going back to like i think we've got some from like the the late 90s i mean they're all in such good shape just this vineyard always lends itself to age really well mm -hmm. um yeah, and I think because it is rockier, there tends to be a little bit more tension here than yeah. other wines. So there's always this sort of like this mineral aspect. Um, there's always this sort of nice cut that you get here um, as opposed to Red Hills, for instance, which is a lot deeper. So I feel like you get more of a, a fruit characteristic as opposed to Arcus where, you know, you definitely have that fruit, but there's, there's a little something extra. But I feel like this is one of our more versatile wines yeah it's intellectual but also very inviting and while it does have fruit to it there's still there's still a, a little earthy component it's not a lot but it's still a little bit earthy component to it to kind of remind you that this is not california pinot right right this is oregon right so it, it's it's pulls you back in um so yeah i mean it's got that good balance on that really good acidity to it um you were talking about um, when we were walking around, around the winery. What your philosophy is is when you're when you're picking, that you're not trying to have a lot of hang time. That's right. Yeah. yeah. We. I mean, a lot of people talk about flavors you get the longer you hang, mm -hmm. and you know, I have a hard time with that. It's probably one of the the main things that I'm I'm looking at as a winemaker. I don't taste like strawberries, or blueberries, you know, or like summer raspberries. Like the longer that fruit hangs on the vine. I feel like what I'm looking for is physiological maturity. You yeah. know, like we go through, we, we fill up buckets of, of fruit, we press them, uh, we run bricks, pH, TA, and then I get that spreadsheet, I walk out into the vineyard when we're in the picking window, and you just, you start to notice things. You chew on the fruit, you spit into your hand, see if you get any color, you look to see what the seeds look like, then you see what the seeds taste like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, make sure that the fruit's colored up, but, you know, I like to make wines that are, are balanced and not incredibly high with alcohol. Yeah. I feel like Oregon wine, an Oregon Pinot can be on the sweeter profile. Like there's, a, there's an inherent sweetness, I think, to the wines. So I think when you increase the ethanol content by having higher bricks and you get into the high 14s, you mm know, -hmm. I feel like that adds an extra sweetness. It does. That we don't need, you yeah. know. And I feel like there's enough material there and i feel like those flavors get unlocked during fermentation you know i feel like when people are tasting fruit and you know saying that they're tasting flavor i think a lot of people are just tasting sugar so getting yeah. that fruit in that right that right time it's always that uh that that strange phenomenon like you know that it's here you know harvest is here i always say it's like uh you're driving like a huge ship and you're coming into port and you can't stop and you can land gracefully or you can run into that lake, you know? <laughs> right, yeah. So our, our philosophy is usually like, you know, if the numbers look good and you walk up into the site and it tastes good and it seems fine, maybe we're looking at 13% alcohol and, you know, maybe even a little less than that. Eh, take a little bit, just yeah. like this year. Right, yeah. And then, you know, you, you like how the fermentation is behaving. Um, you continue to pull in. And when you really want to start pulling in, a lot of our, our vineyards are at the same elevation. Mm -hmm. And I feel like when one vineyard's ready, the others are not very far behind it. So our philosophy is pick a little bit. It may be on the early side, but that's fine. You can make those wines very approachable and fun, and we can put them in our Dundee Hills. Yeah. But 80% of that vintage, I want just right. 
I want to bring it in and we can only process 15 to 20 tons a day. Yeah, so you can bring it all at the same time. Exactly. Yeah. So then you start looking at, you know, your BRICS charts and, you know, your chemistries, your acids are changing. It's like, even if I wanted to pull all this fruit in tomorrow, I can't. So you have to start deciding like when to bring things in so you can get most of it in at the right time. And I think, you know, we, we like to build the wines in the fermenter. I don't rely on oak. Uh, we're about 30% new oak on average. Mm -hmm. And we generally will get rid of our barrels after three vintages. Okay. So there is a generous amount of, I would say new oak, and, but in one, in one use oak. So yeah, the 30% of that's new, but I feel like those oak nuances that I'm, I'm using and working with are accentuating the fruit. Mm -hmm. And I think I build a lot of intensity in the fermenter. So when you're, we're picking on the fresh side, you know, we, we generally do pump over just to kind of get things going, get things flowing, um, get those fermentation cells and get that fruit to sort of start closing on itself so that instead of punching down and exposing those seed sacs and starting to macerate those immediately, yeah. I like to keep things kind of condensed in little sacks. Okay. And then we'll start to pump over and punch down simultaneously. And I feel like it's still very gentle because as you're pumping that, that wine over, and you come down with your punch down tool, you're able to keep that fruit intact and keep that seed enclosed. Okay. And then as we get towards the end of fermentation, we'll taste the wines. So at night, it's like we did a pump over, let's say, and a pump over punch down in the afternoon. And right after that pump over punch down, we'll grab a sample, or we'll let it sit on our lab bench. And then in the morning, you know, everybody comes in yawning, uh, you know, the first wine you taste is always difficult because somebody just brushed their teeth or just drank some more yeah. juice. But yeah, that's, uh, that can be rough. It's the best experience though because the winery is super quiet. Nobody's worrying about like jumping on a pump or like getting into things. It, and this is going back to Nicholas again. You know, this is his advice from like the Jedi master. <laughs> you just like create white space. And I think that's our white space because you go through each wine. They're all cooled down. The leaves have settled. Because if you take a sample right after you work a tank, okay. the leaves are in suspension and you smell it and you're like, I think I got it. And you taste it. But there's so many leaves like in the wine that you can't really get a you're good tasting sense. tasting that. Yeah. yeah. Like you can get a little bit of tannin, but it's like, oh, it's just strange. And sometimes it, it throws off your per perceptibility of the wine. So when we come in in the morning and taste, everything's settled out and you get a good sense of what the nose is like. I feel like during ferment, yeah, it's hard to tell exactly what the nose should be. I mean, if you smell vinegar or, or <laughs> yeah. ethyl acetate or something, yeah, it's like, that's some, bad. Yeah, it's bad, yeah. 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 But you know that the wine's going to fill in and, and, and be something good because everything's tracking well. And, you know, by, by tasting and looking to see what that last thing you did the night before was, you can repeat it again mm -hmm. or decide that you need to be a little bit more aggressive or maybe you need to heat some more. And that's something that we rely on because we're picking fresh. We generally like the ferments to get a little warmer towards the end okay. because we need to extract. Because I feel like sometimes there's not a lot to extract from. Whereas if you pick, you know, way later, your mm -hmm. the skins get leathery and you're, you know, you're adding water to dilute the sugar and all that. Oh, yeah. And you use the same amount of heat. I feel like you can get into a dangerous sort of extraction. Okay. So you can't do one without the other. And I feel like a lot of people at Archery Summit have kind of grown to expect wines that are, are filling and have a good presence. And after tasting through all the wines from all my predecessors and then working the second harvest this year, I'm starting to get a really good sense that these vineyards have a lot to say. And I'm just, I'm just kind of here with my guys to kind of steer it into a really pretty spot. Yeah. Yeah. Very it's, cool. It's yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. Yeah. And no year's no year is the same, that's for sure. Exactly. Especially this year, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little bit of a nail biter. Yeah. Yeah. We uh we yeah, had a few rain episodes. Mm -hmm. You know, first rain, no problem. You know, things dry out. Second rain, it's like, okay, are we gonna have botrytis? You look out, it's like, well, maybe there's a little uh all right, that vineyard needs to come in. You know, because I don't want it to sit out any longer. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we had another rain episode and it was like, okay, you know, like it's going to start setting in. And again, even if you want to pick 
and especially year like 2019, some of our vineyards like Arcus are like this. You can't get a tractor in, even if it's a crawler, yeah. you know, and then the workers are going to be slipping on the ground. So there's also like a human aspect of it. So trying to get ahead of things and realizing that, you know, we had a high, uh, it was like 22, five to 23. Okay. Bricks. And you know, we have potential alcohols of 12, eight to 13. And you just go through this exercise where you're like, are you going to change? Are you going to get any better? You start taking fruit in and then you make these determinations. Like I think halfway through harvest, we realize that we're not going to gain anything from having our fruit sitting out. Okay. It's not going to get better. Because it was cold too, right? Yeah. It got so, really cold towards yeah. the end. Yeah. We, we had all of our fruit in before we started flirting with, um, you know, those like potential freezing days. Yeah. We had one block or one, yeah, one is like one ton actually of Chardonnay from Kusa Vineyard up in Eol Amity. Okay. We just had the first crop where we're like, oh no, you know, like, are we going to freeze on the vine? And we got through it. Yeah. Yeah. But it was, it was a really interesting harvest. Just those, those aha moments <laughs> that you, you, you hope that you have sooner than later. Right. Yeah. You know, you convince yourself of a lot, but I think, um, as soon as we started kind of picking off the vine and we realized that the chemistries didn't really change much at all from one week to the other, that we were, we were doing okay. Right. And this is probably the most organ vintage, um, I've seen since probably 2010. Yeah. yeah it's, it's really, it's really lovely. These, nice. Chardonnays and Pinots. Nice, yeah. Everything fermented beautifully. Um, there's a lot of color intensity. And yeah, I think these wines have a lot of character. And they're not like really high alcohol. No, which is, which is good. I prefer that. Yeah, exactly. You know, get back to alcohol. Um, you know, alcohol gives you apparent sweetness. Even if even if you have two wines, they were they're fermented to the same amount of sugar level. Maybe say there's zero or maybe like one gram. And once higher alcohol, it's going to be perceived as sweeter. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. Even, it's, if, even if it's the same sugar. For yeah. sure. And I mean, I, I think using that as a, like a component, like let's say something is going to be like high 12s, um, you know, capitalizing 213 or mm -hmm. just past that, I do feel like that, that ethanol kind of helps kind of mold the wine together. And yeah. I, I think that it, it creates a, yeah, maybe a, a more enticing nose, right. you know? It, it kind of uh, makes it pop out of the glass a little bit more. Right. And a little sweetness there is great. But, you know, you, I, I feel like finding that line mm -hmm. is really important. Absolutely. Uh, what's, our, what's our next wine? I'm gonna, All right. So I think we'll, I'll make sure I have the least comparison here. So this is our that. 2017 Dundee Hills. All right, cool. So this vintage, I think what it may lack in color still has tons in, ten, in, in I'd say, in, in density um, and in structure. Okay. I think, you know, these are both like warmer vintages, 2016 and 2017. And this wine is just sort of coming out of its shell. So um, our Arcus retails for $125 a bottle. Good. So I'm about to ask you because we forgot <laughs> to ask you on, on, on the first one. The Dundee Hill Pinot here goes for 65 This okay. is also in distribution. And, you know, some years, like, it's my favorite wine just right out of the gate because it's a blend of all of our different sites. Yeah. You know, Arcus and Red Hills are our largest vineyards. So they generally will drive this wine depending on the year. Just kind of depends on what's working and what's not, but this tends to be Arcus and Red Hills driven. Um, we do about 30% whole cluster okay. on average for all of our wines. Mm -hmm. um, we've got the space for it in fermenter, which is great. Okay. Cause if you de-stem, then you have all this headspace, right? Yeah. So if you, if you use whole cluster, it takes up way more space in fermenter. But we have enough fruit to where we can use a lot of whole cluster. And okay. I feel like it works really well with the Dundee profile. Yeah. So for me on this one, um, it's not as fruit forward as the other one. Mm -hmm. It's a little more reserved. It's a touch more spice driven. Like, you know, there's, I feel like there's a little more cinnamon to it. Definitely has a little bit more. But cut. then again, I get cinnamon on this one now too, but it's also been sitting in the glass for a little bit. Right. I mean, in 16s, they, they are a little lusher. Yeah, this They're is definitely on that. A little juicier. Mm -hmm. Whereas like, I feel like there's more like dried spice 
yeah. dried fruit, mm -hmm. cranberry. Yeah, that too. Yeah. On the on the tw 2017, and I mean it's it's a wine that you know we're we're actually we're transitioning between the 17 and 18 right now. Okay. Um, in distribution, oh, they're both really lovely, but I think it gives people a a pretty good sense of like who we are as a, an organization, and I think like what all of our vineyards do and what they all do together. Right. It just kind of walks people into our brand. Yeah. About how long does a wine sit in oak um, while you're aging it? So with the Dundee Hills, we'll go anywhere from nine to 10 months in oak. Okay. And then for Arcus, we uh, just adopted a new program when I came on board. Well, we're, we'll take it out of barrel after nine or 10 months, mm -hmm. get it into tank, and then put it back down to neutral oak. Okay. So then it sits in neutral oak for about another six months. And by doing that, uh, we're able to not filter those wines. Okay. So Summit, uh, Red Hills, and Arcus generally don't see any sort of filtration at all. Okay. You have a little bit of that lazy component that I feel like fills in the palate and kind of helps out texturally. Okay. I feel like it helps with longevity, and gives mm -hmm. a wine a little bit more life and bottle. Okay. But with the Dundee Hills, our Willamette Valley, Renegade Ridge, and Archer's Edge, we tend to have a shorter program on those because we like the life that they have. Um, we don't feel like they don't need to be rounded out or incorporated more and okay. they have a little bit more freshness to them. Yeah. But, um, it's, it's something I'm still playing with. You know, we sit down in a couple of years, I may say something different. It's, <laughs> right. It's amazing what you do in this industry, how your well, thought you and style go through evolution. Well, yeah, you have to be flexible because, you know, things, things change in the vineyard, you know, um, I mean, year to year there's differences i mean we have seen climate change happening so you know that there's things that are, that are changing i mean yes each year can be kind of different and may you know this year doesn't seem to be like a as far as a temperature wise doesn't necessarily seem to be a climate change year but there's things that happen with that but yeah i mean and you you learn new things you know you find out new stuff new technologies come through oh yeah yeah and that's our big i think that's a yeah. big focus right now is like is global warming because i mean mm -hmm. last year there's an incredible stretch with no water yeah you know and of course it rained the day that we were bottling you know it was like oh <laughs> right. like right before harvest but it afforded us a little bit more hang hang time because yeah. you know the fruit was just racing through it was like sugar 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 and then everything else was just slightly behind it like the color and the seed maturity so it afforded us you know a little bit more time to you know have something balanced right. this year i feel like with the rains everything caught up and there's an incredible amount of balance. But like you're saying, I think, you know, we are, we are anticipating longer stretches with no water, mm -hmm. hotter conditions. And, you know, we're doing a lot of experimentation right now with compost. So we spray compost tea on certain sections of Arcus. Okay. Yeah. We do it in combination with, um, compost on the ground and then we do till versus no till. So we've got six different um, experiments that we're running or six, six different sections that we're running at Arcus that we're, we're just trying to figure out like with no irrigation um, and hey, maybe irrigation is a good idea yeah. with how hot it's getting. But let's say we don't irrigate. Um, are we able to keep more water holding capacity in the soil because we're composting? And are, are we helping the vine out by, you know, giving it a little bit of foliar help you know, yeah. letting, letting the bacteria allow these essential macro and micronutrients into the leaf and give these vines more of a chance when they're going through like the really hot part of the season. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're, we just got into it this last year cool. and we're uh, collecting a lot of material and just seeing, you know, whether or not we could uh, adopt this on other sites. And I would like to go to Burgundy and talk to them more about it. And, I think the general consensus that I've heard so far is that people are planning more kind of like field variation instead of relying on one clone of one yeah, root stock. They do a lot of mass cell selection. Um, and I know uh, in my visit with um, uh, yesterday over at res residence with Guillaume, not that they necessarily do it, but they're, that they have some mass cell selection going on over there too. It's great. Um, but then again, they're, they're, they're French. Right. <laughs> so, I mean, that's it's what like, they know. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's in their DNA. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, if you like, cut open their arm, they probably like drip out Pinot Noir. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, uh, 
so that'd be a good. This is a good uh, time to maybe talk about uh, your certifications, uh, as far as your uh, vineyard practices and all that. Exactly. So I don't think we talked about that yet. Have yeah, we? Okay. we haven't. No. Okay. So we are life certified. Mm -hmm. um, we're proud to be life certified. Um, low impact viticulture and enology. And essentially, they uh, have a system in place where you monitor your chemical usage. Um, we look to see like how much electricity we're using, how much water we're using. They they put caps on how much sulfur you could spray, for instance, in a year. Mm -hmm. And they restrict a lot of chemicals from being used that they deem um, you know, harmful to the environment, harmful to the atmosphere, to the water. Right. And you know, we're, we're proud to be life certified. I think in the winery, we're going more that direction, but we're very good about like monitoring how much water we use. Mm -hmm. um, Archery Summit is part of the Crimson Wine Group. Yeah. So we've got a number of different wineries in our portfolio. Um, we've got Sigacio, who mm -hmm. right now is going through um, some yeah. fire troubles. Absolutely, like I, yeah. Yeah, I hope they find their way out of. Absolutely, yeah. And Pine Ridge, mm -hmm. which is in Napa. And, you know, we've got Fintan, who's, uh, he's down south. Um, and I'm, it used to be Domain Alfred, and right now I'm spacing on the name because I'm on the spot right now. They've got their Moline brand, uh, Chemisol. Duh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Chemisol. <laughs> yeah. Duh. He actually just emailed me. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a benchmark tasting with them. Cool. Um, and next week, nice. yeah, they sit down and go through their wines and their competitors. We do it as well here, mm -hmm. and we had him come and taste with us. Um, they make awesome wine down there, and then up north we've got Double Canyon and seven hills mm -hmm. so i think collectively you know it's a it's a really fun group of people um all the winemakers are characters you know they all seem very down to earth um, very serious at what they do but it's always fun to collaborate or you know give somebody a call it's like hey i'm thinking about buying a pump mm -hmm. and you know how do you have you do you have a good experience with it like yeah let me tell you about it right or you know there's an experiment that i want to run um I, I saw that you had run the same experiment. Is, is it worth doing? You know, sharing equipment and it's uh, it, it's 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 really good to right. be able to profit from one another. Cool. But I digress. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's fine. Yeah. In, in terms of the vineyards, though, I just I feel like you know with Tim Tim Scott, who's been farming in the Dundee Hills for 37 years, he's uh, he's incredible. Um, he definitely when I came on board, I think he was a little concerned because. I came from um, Evening Land, who was 100% biodynamic, and you know I, I'm eliminating glyphosate and Roundup from yeah. each one of our vineyards. So we eliminated it from Summit last year, right. and we're going to eliminate it from Arcus this next year. And we're just going to go vineyard by vineyard. Um, you know, we all know that it's uh, it's just one of those things that is surfacing a lot in California where people are talking about non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and mm -hmm. there's a lot of studies that say that it's good, it's fine for humans, it disassociates in the soil, and there's other, other studies that say it's not. And um, well, I, What's your philosophy on that? If you don't <laughs> spray a chemical on, you don't consume the chemical. Right. So if you eliminate <laughs> yeah. it, you don't have to drink it, you don't have to absorb it through your skin, right. you don't have to worry about the re-entry interval, you know, you're, you're just, you're not consuming it. Right. So, I mean, I think it's really intelligent to know um, what the mode of action is for each one of these chemicals and be smart. But I, again, if we don't have them, we, we don't have to deal with them. Right. So Tim, is, Tim has been a, an incredible sport about, you know, eliminating them and working out ways to, you know, farm a little bit differently. Yeah. There's, there's other ways you can do it. Maybe they don't have the same, I don't know, efficiency. Um, as maybe some of the other chemicals out there, but you're still going to have, at the end of the day, you're going to come up with a high quality product. Um, and that's going to be, um, hopefully safer than, I think so. than what, than what is prior. Definitely. Yeah. And it makes you a lot better at, uh, like with timing. So like you can spray Roundup like from a quad and go up and down the rows and finish a, you know, a 40 acre vineyard in two days. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you don't, spray you've got to go out generally with like a weed bar or another contraption that will scrape the weeds out from underneath the vine so okay. that they're not comp competing with the vine or growing up into it so you just you got to get in there at the right time right with this the right soil moisture and you're spending a lot more time like on the tractor which is more costly for labor mm -hmm. and you're also using a lot more diesel to okay. get rid yeah. of those weeds so it's like 
It's that, a trade-off. It is. And a lot of people are like, well, you know, if you're, if you're spreading glyphosate, you're, you're, you're not compacting the ground, you're not using diesel, you're not spending a lot of money on labor. And if you're doing the contrary, maybe you're doing a disservice to the planet. But I think with Tim, we can, we can say like, hey, maybe we don't need to scrape weeds out from that section. Yeah. You know, like, or we can figure out another way of, you know, maybe mowing a little bit more cleverly and like supporting the soil and encouraging mycorrhizal populations. Mm -hmm. So it, it's fun working with somebody that's, uh, you know, w wanting to work with me and, you know, not necessarily going back into the old chemical ways that a lot of people are, are used to yeah. doing and using. Yeah. yeah, I mean, take a look at Burgundy, what they did po post-war uh, with everything they did, how they farmed, and now they're as a, I mean, it's not, it's not law or anything, but as a community, it feels like they're trying to get out of using as much of that as possible because oh, yeah. they feel like their land's dead. Definitely. Yeah. No, I mean, and that's just from glyphosate, but just like the overall conventional farming methods have like just kind of destroyed the the uh, the soil. And we talk about how like poor soil is great for, for grapes, but it has to have something. Oh yeah. Yeah. It I can't mean, it's just be barren. No, it's like any plant. Yeah, yeah. You need a balance. There's like essential macro micronutrients. Yeah. You know. I do know the whole thing. See Hopkins Cafe, managed by my cousin Clyde Como. No, I'm oh, like, what is this? It's, it's like, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally for like parentheses, exponents. There's this little, there's this little thing that we learn in college. Okay. With all the essential macro and Got micronutrients, it. so you, you can go through and figure out each compound that compound that you need. Okay. And you know, if you're lacking one of these compounds, your cell walls, for example, if you don't have enough calcium, mm -hmm. because there's too much potassium in the soil the the canes get brittle okay so yeah you need a certain amount of that and every soil is different and every soil has its set of um challenges right but, yeah grapes need sun they need water <laughs> yeah and they need macro micronutrients and you know it's our job to find that balance right, right. and make sure that they're supported just like we do it's like yeah, it's yeah. Just like us. And sometimes yeah. you luck out. Sometimes Mother Nature serves up a, a soft one. Yeah. But you know, other times it's it's difficult. Yeah. And especially with global warming, because when you subtract water, you know, you can't just expect the vine to keep functioning, especially young vines or baby yeah. vines. So there's definitely uh, there's definitely some hand holding that you need to do in the vineyard. And yeah, you want. I think the antithesis of like an overly vigorous wine is a, a slightly stressed out vine. Oh yeah. And I think you, there's a, there's a, a level of that stress that you want, you know, you don't want the, the vine to go crazy and have an overabundance of things, but you also don't want it to like, you not be able to function properly because a stressed vine will give you stress fruit. Mm -hmm. It smells funny. It tastes funny. Yeah. So, so it's, it's a, it's a constant dance. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Shall we get into yeah, the last wine? Definitely. So yeah. I like to finish with Chardonnay. I um, <clears throat> I worked with of you. Ah, it's very Burgundian. I worked with Dominique <laughs> Lafon for years yeah. at Evening Land, and I always remember he's the first person to expose me to this. He would talk about um, drinking water and drinking lemonade. He's like, so if you have a glass of water, and then you have a glass of lemonade, the lemonade tastes great. Mm -hmm. But if you have lemonade and then you drink a glass of water the water sort of like crumbles on your palate. It feels really strange because you've got all that lingering acid. Yeah. I feel like it's the same with red wines and white wines. In general, if the white is more acidic than your, your reds, it actually cleans off your palate. And that's ex pretty much exactly how they described it to me over there. Um, not everybody did it that way, but the first couple that did it, I, I remarked, it's like, this is interesting. You're, you're doing it this way. And they explained why, they explained why. It's like, I get it. Like, I mean, like as soon as it happened, I went, I get this. And I mean, I kind of have done that for years at industry tastings where it's not that I start with the reds, but I mix up whites and reds. Mm -hmm. A lot of those also to try to like not have just black teeth at the end. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Like kind of clean up a little start bit. with bubbles, hit the whites, <laughs> go to some reds and then alternate white, red, white, red, white, red, and then finish with the whites and then finish with bubbles, bubbles. because, well, you should. But I, I, and this is more probably just me making assumptions, but the carbonation is also helping break up anything on your teeth, maybe. I don't know. But to me, it's like that carbonation is like having like a, like, you know, when you put your dentures into the, 
winners. So. Oh, yeah, <laughs> totally. Just kind of like cleans them off. I mean, but re- in reality, I'd have to probably have champagne or bubbles in my mouth for like minutes at a time, <laughs> not just like a little bit and spit out. I'm sure but, the champagne producers would like love that idea. They're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You should have a, have a glass before you go to bed. But it seems like it works a little bit more. So when I, I'm done with the tasting, if I go look in a mirror and I look at my teeth, they're not black. But if I did the traditional start with bubbles, go to white, and only fit and finish with reds, I have like black tea. That's hilarious. So my that's head. kind of my not secret, but that's how I kind of do tastings is I kind of alternate um, what style of wine I'm, I'm doing. I'll like hit that. I'll, I also go when I do tastings, I also look for the table that has nobody in front of it. Uh, that doesn't mean the wine's bad. This just no. means there's nobody there. It means I can ask questions. I can get, you know, take that. I don't want to take up all their time, but I can ask questions and I get a little more personal attention with the wine. Whereas if you're like fighting like 10 people in front of the table, it's yeah. like, can I have some more wine? You're like, you know, so. We I, like people like you. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we, that's where you go to those things so that you can like interact and, you yeah. know, like let people know what your brand is. And yeah. at some point, like if there's a wine you really want to try and that table's never empty, you just, you just try to go when there's like the least amount of people right. and you just stand there like, okay, I'm making my pilgrimage to yada yada wine. It's everyone has to have, and I'm like, okay, cool. And it's, it's, they're good wines. It's just that everybody, especially industry people, they all know like, okay, I've got to have that, you know, for sure. Or so-and-so is pouring like a rare wine. Oh, man, the word gets out quick. Got to go to the table. So-and-so. All right. Why they got, they got like a age this, or they have, they only bring this. Okay. Boom. We get it. Those you are know? the best though. Don't, don't like, wait till hey, the end. So-and-so told me to come over here and try it. You're like, yeah, yeah I'm Cause they only had like one, one bottle of that. They it's didn't like bring the, like two this, or three. Sneaker. Yeah. The under the table <laughs> one. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. So back to Chardonnay. 20, so 2017. Yeah. Um, so this is from Yola Amity Hills. So it's a, Von, the vineyard's called Von Usen. Okay. So it's right across the street from seven Springs. Um, Right across the street from Bjornsson, Bjornsson Winery. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've been working with these guys a little while. It's uh, a family-run operation, and I think the fruit is so good. And Seven Springs, I mean, you talk about in a unique terroir, you know, uh, an area that suits Chardonnay really well. You know, you've got this, like, really good texture. There's always a really nice minerality. Mm-hmm. It's always very citrusy. Yeah. And we're over the moon about this site. And this is part of our Yola Amity portfolio. I would okay. love to put their name on the label, and I think they would love for us to do that too. But as we grow this this wine, you know, it's going to be harder and harder to do. But I have to give a you know a shout out to the Piastas who yeah. um, had the vision to build this site up because Von Usen Vineyard is is so tasty. But we go for a leaner style. Yeah, it definitely is. Um, you got some really great fruit. I got some really good apple in this. So I'm going to assume it doesn't go through a full mallow. It um, does. It does? Yeah. But we, I feel like I get some good apple on it. But maybe it's not the acidity that I'm getting. And I feel like a lot of it too. Like, I mean, we, we try. We try to get it to go through 100% malolactic every year. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think with this wine, it was like there's a very minute amount of uh, malic acid. I mean, I'm... It's very, very Maybe it's like 99% mallow. Yeah. yeah, okay. So, I mean, that's our MO. So, we try to pick early. Um, just make sure that, like, everything's physiologically right. Um, you know, this was about 13% alcohol and change. Mm-hmm. Uh, we let it sit in barrel for about nine months. And then after nine months, we take everything out of barrel, get all the leaves, too. So, when you go to the receiving tank and pull a sample, it's, like, cloudy and crazy. And we let it sit on the leaves for another six months. And then after six months, we do a little finding, um, very light filtration, okay. and it's off to the races. So it's a, it's a longer program, and I think because we're pulling the fruit in on the fresher side, but we're relying on it to have that you know interaction with those leaves and go through that autolytic uh, process okay. to kind of richen up the wine, um, I feel like it's, it kind of seals the deal. And I feel like maybe that's where we get a little bit of that appleiness. Like something I that think that's get, probably where it's getting, yeah. Like somebody getting a champagne almost. Yeah, yeah. I think so. I, mean, I totally see that. What does this run? So we're $48 a bottle here. Okay, cool. Yeah, I mean, it, it feels very Burgundian. Um, you know, uh, there's a, definitely a richness to it. Like That's definitely from the Lee's contact and Lee's stirring and all that. Um, but yeah, I think... I think where I'm getting that appleiness is more of the flavor rather than necessarily like it's like the malic acid. Right. So um, it has, it's like, because there's also, because there's also um, a creaminess to it that can also be lees, 
but it's not really acidic. You know, so right. yeah, definitely, you know, I just didn't know if it was a partial or went through the whole thing. Well, and I think yeah. because there's there's a lot of tartaric acid too, I think mm -hmm. when you go through that 100% mallow and that lactic acid is there, okay. it plays really well with the richness that you get from the leaves and then with that other tartaric acid com component. Um, Chardonnay is so much fun. I mean, we, we are a Pinot house, but something that um, I talked a lot to Nicholas about was Chardonnay. And we really want to start being, you know, associated with some of the, I'd say more influential Chardonnay producers in the state. Right. You know, I've worked with, you know, Dominique for years at Evening Land. You know, I, I worked in, uh, in Burgundy and we, we had a negotiant at, at Evening Land, Evening Land Cote d'Or. So I made tons of Puy Fuisse mm -hmm. and uh, Maconnet wines. I uh, got to work closely with Dominique Lafon on his own wines. And, right. you know, people always talk about, like, you know, making Burgundian wine in Oregon. And it's like, we can't do that. Because no, it's, it's Oregon. It's Oregon. I you mean, know? You, can have, you can have elements of it. Right. Yeah, like, like, you know, all these wines have somewhat of that roots of Burgundy in it because these are where those grapes are coming from. Right. I mean, the home of, of these grapes is over there. But... Um, but they're still, or it's still Oregonian. It's not at its, its core. Yeah, it's not a French wine, nor is it a, a wine that's from anywhere else. It's not a New Zealand Pinot. It's not, you know, Australian Chardonnay. It's not California. Right. Um, it's funny though. It's like my father-in-law. He he loves wine. He doesn't consider himself like a novice or anything. He, but he buys wine. He enjoys drinking it. Jura. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. Gets he all likes geeky. Chablis. Yeah. You know, champagne. Um, but he, the last time he was visiting, they helped us out during harvest watching or helping my wife watch our kids. And, uh, he's like, you know, I'll tell you, like Chablis is probably my favorite area. And he's like, Oregon Chardonnay is probably my first or second favorite, like type of white wine in the world. He's nice. like, there's no place in the world that makes wines like this vibrant and this persistent and this textural and. He's like, you know, he, he's, a, he's a big organ chard guy, but there is something very, very special. And I think as we're talking about before with the Willamette Valley Wineries Association, mm -hmm. you know, getting more involvement, having our wine auction, um, you know, kind of giving Napa a run for their money and letting the world know that, you know, we, we're here and we're making incredible wines. We raised over a million dollars, which is uh, really important for us as we have installations all over the country and we participate and moderate and I just think educate people to what yeah. Oregon can do. But I mean, I, I feel like, you know, the West for a lot of the world is the wild West, you know, mm -hmm. it's where people found gold and rushed out here on wagons. And I think there's still a little bit of that pioneering spirit, okay. but we've been doing this since 1965 and there has been a lot of really healthy influence from people from Burgundy and California. And Oregon is definitely realizing, I think, what they're good at and what they can be better at. And I think Chardonnay, more than Pinot Noir, I'm not saying that Oregon has Pinot Noir down and there's not room for growth, but I think the way that Chardonnay has grown as like, as like a percepted thing from Oregon and how we've grown as an industry mm -hmm. and taking talking Chardonnay seriously, I think we've made leaps and bounds over the last three years. Yeah. We have a technical tasting where we have all the winemakers who want to participate by AVA submit a wine that's in a neutral oak barrel, has gone through mallow, hasn't been f like freshly sulfured, and we have two huge tables with, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing over 100 wines. Oh, my God. You can taste by AVA, soil, rootstock clone, pick date, whatever you want. And then you go back to your table and you discuss. And all of us have an opportunity to kind of see what each other does, what they do differently. There's a panel that ran specific experiments that everybody can learn from. Mm -hmm. And then I think in general, you kind of scan the room and you leave this event and you think like, oh shit, these wines are so much better than the year before. And those wines were better than the year before that. Okay. And I think part of that is because we're talking more and we're figuring out what works and doesn't and experimenting with stuff that works. Not stuff we're curious about, but mm -hmm. stuff that we know 
can only go a positive way. And okay. it's, it's, really, it's really cool to see. And I, I think the public is starting to rush back in. And in the process of discovering Chardonnay, I think they're rediscovering how freaking awesome our Pinots are too. Yeah. Yeah. So like with Chardonnay, um, I mean, I've talked with other people. Um, one of the things that, that I understand that held it back was that they had some of the California Chardonnays that were coming up here and they may not have been quite the right ones. It's the 108 clone, yeah. which is coming back. Yeah. So we had so because I've had other people like talk about 108, and it seems like the Chardonnays are good. So maybe it's just learning how to use the clone I up wish, here. Yeah, I wish I could like go in my time capsule and like travel back. It's like yeah. were people just hanging the bejesus mm -hmm. out of these vines? You know, were they hanging eight tons an acre? Mm -hmm. You wonder if that was part of it. And then I think the other part was you know, there's a very long like string of cool vintages. And I think when you look at the morphology of the Dijon 108 cluster, they are rather large. So there's like a really high skin to juice ratio. And, you know, I, I feel like texturally, you're not going to get a lot from the skins. Again, you know, you, you think about the equipment that they use to process this fruit, mm -hmm. coupled with the cool, maybe not getting it to the right bricks or physiological materi maturity, having a lot of green notes. Okay. I think that, you know, like people are still kind of figuring out how to make Chardonnay, whereas now, it's a lot warmer. Mm -hmm. I think collectively we have way more degree days. Um, we can have cool vintages, which would be interesting to see how 108 performs, but I feel like people aren't cropping as much. And I think there's a little bit more of a know-how. There's a more, little bit more communication with, you know, the motherland yeah. in Burgundy. And uh, I think I, I, I can see Dijon 108 being pretty cool out here. You yeah. know, I, I can see it working for a lot of people. I wouldn't go all in. But, right. Yeah. You know, I, I would like to play with some myself. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice. Um, so before I forget, so I took pictures. So we're in this cave. What do you have over there that I'll, you'll have pictures. Okay. I got two, I took two pictures of it. So tell me what's, what's over there when people come in here to check that out. So in our A-list lounge, we've got a wall of basalt or basalt, depending on how you want to say it. And not bath salts, not bath salt. Those are bad. I'm like, hmm, that's an interesting, <laughs> that's an interesting idea. But, uh, so it's the mother rock to Jory soil. So when you come in and look at it and when you show them the, the photo that you took, it's in its glade state. So it's in its, uh, reduced state. And when it starts to break up with physical and chemical weathering and ends up on the top of the ground and there's no water, um, submerging it all the time. Cause there's always water kind of cascading through this to make yeah, it look Yeah, I did right. see some. So yeah. because it's always wet, it can't oxidize. But when you go to the surface and there's no water and it oxidizes, it turns red, which is kind of like our, uh, our identity out here. We're like in the red hills. Of right, yeah. So it's really cool to see. I mean, it's really hard rock. Like, mm -hmm. You're not, you're not going to get much through it. And it, it percolates all year long. It's, it's dripping all year long. Yeah. Even last year without a rain for a hundred days it was still dripping through yeah it's it's pretty cool to see it's very nice um yeah i think i think we've kind of covered everything is there anything that we maybe haven't talked about do you want to like gosh i mean i talking about um the willamette valley wineries association and yeah you know like how uh how everybody works together here in oregon mm -hmm. is really special I, I always want people to to realize that and if people haven't come out to Oregon, you need to come out to Oregon to taste because you will have the time of your life. Not only do we have really good wine out here, but culinarily, I think we're killing it. There's a lot of uh, farm to table movements. Mm -hmm. And instead of you know going someplace for a couple days and getting tired of it, you can come here for weeks and never yeah. get bored. I can tell you, um, so I, I, you didn't know this because you're, I'm gonna tell you now. So Friday, Friday night, I went to the horseradish nice. and they had a Marshall Davis, which is like the winery next door. Oh yeah. Um, they had their own little wine dinner there and yeah, definitely some cool stuff was going on culinarily there. For sure. Um, I didn't particularly care for some of the items, which, and I, I actually, would, I sat at the VIP table. I sat next to, um, Ryan, I kept wanting to say Sean, Ryan, uh, and his, and his wife, uh, Julie, who runs the restaurant, right? right. And, uh, and then the mom was there, so oh, right. Ryan's mom, and then his dad showed up. So 
you know, the, the first dish, well, what was that appetizer? It was bubbles. They don't make bubbles. Was, I can't remember who the producer was Maybe on that. Like Argyle or No, it was, it was like somebody I had never heard of. Okay. So, um, but it was definitely local. Uh, well, I mean, Oregon. Um, and then um, uh, it was like this little, like, like a crostini with like roe. I don't like seafood, right. which I know like freaks people out that I don't like seafood. What? It's, not, it's not an allergy. It's just I just don't like it. And so I was like, okay, I'll skip that. When I told Ryan, I was like, I'm going to skip that one. Like, just so you know, I'm just, don't, don't worry. Like, I'm, I'm, there'll be plenty of food. And then the next three, I, the next, the rest of the menu, there was like a, like an item or two of it that I wasn't really a fan of, but I ate, I ate it, you know, and, but it was delicious. So like even the mushroom soup, which I'm not a fan of mushrooms, I could see how, so it's kind of like when I, I taste a wine that I don't like personally, but I know it's well-made. Right. I can pick out why it's good and why people like it and appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, why they appreciate it. And that was with that mushroom soup. It paired really well with the Pinot Noir. Like it was a good pairing. Perfect. So, but, and then we had like, we had pumpkin ravioli um, uh, with like a mustard oil and other stuff. And then there was, there was braised beef. Um, and then we had a protiferol, whatever they pronounce with oh. quince ice cream oh, right. inside it. Like that stuff sounds... with, yeah, and then like a candy lemon. So, Sounds really lovely. Yeah, I mean, the menu was like, and it was like ninety-five bucks. Like it was absolutely reasonable. And I think this is in their new spot. I think they yeah, got a they, new they, spot they just too. moved to that new spot like a couple weeks ago. Oh right, I have to check it out. I, yeah, I used to go there. So I I worked in the town of Carlton. Yeah, for you know, almost three years. So I went to their lunch spot. Like went yeah, to the horse ride is like the place you go. You yeah, know? like I can't tell you how many sandwiches I've eaten there. I learned I learned about it from my hosts at my Airbnb. Um, shout out to them; they've been outstanding. This is like my last night in town, and uh, you know they're definitely getting a great review. Oh, awesome! <laughs> you know, well, let us know too. We'd yeah. love to send people there. Like when our guest houses book up, like we always yeah. need to know good so, spots. So just so it's on video, it's called Sky Ranch. Great. Um, and uh, Russell and Stacy. Yes, yes, Stacy. Yes. Dang it. <laughs> I just had a brain fart. But um, yes. Not Stacy, not Tracy. Yes. Anyway, if it's wrong, there'll be a lower third that I admit I was wrong. Sorry, guys, if I, I messed it up. But um, apparently, having brain farts in the cave is. Yeah, you know, I guess so. Thing. Well, at least you're not stinky. Because <laughs> um, at least at least it's not yet. It smells it's like nice. it's salt. It smells like basalt. <laughs> um, but uh, they've, been, they've been wonderful. Uh, and they're really cool hosts. Really cool, ho cool hosts. Um, but yeah, uh, that's why I found out about that place. And um, I was going to have dinner there last night, but they're closed on Monday nights. They're open for lunch, though. It's common in wine country. Yeah. It's like, I went somewhere else. It was fun. I had, I had a cool, something fun to do. You know, I went across the street based on the barrel 47. Oh, cool. Yeah. yeah cause, that know, works. Because I, I was going to the tavern like every night the last three nights. Yeah. <laughs> like, I need this. Like, my, li my liver. I've like, always I've become a regular now. They already, they, hey, what's going on, Mark? I'm like, What's going on? Hey guys, <laughs> <laughs> and I've been trying like every single Oregon beer on the on the on their menu, like once. Like, okay, I haven't had that. Let me try that. I repeated one by accident. <laughs> Darn it! <laughs> Oops. But um, who knows? I, my plan tonight is to not go there. My plan is to like watch the Astros game, the World Series tonight at the Airbnb because I have too much wine. I got to consume some of it so I can take whatever I have back. <laughs> Sounds like a great problem. To have. It's a great problem to have. <laughs> but um, anyway, um, so yeah. Uh, it's, it's, Back to the Willamette Valley Association, you know, uh, on my experience, they've definitely helped me with my trip out here. Um, I was able to get some tasting appointments through them. Um, They're a great and, resource. And, and, yeah, and be able to really um, connect with a lot of people. So uh, definitely they're an organization that's awesome. So, you know, hats off to them on my side of things too. Yeah. Uh, and, so Ian? Yeah, yeah. come to Archery Summit. We're come open Archery from Summit, right? 10 to 5 every day of the week. And uh, if you want to call ahead, we'll make sure that you're very well taken care of. Yeah, so absolutely. Please, please come by and say hello. Yeah, so um, yeah, we're going to wrap things up here. Um, so folks, um, like you said, come out here. Um, if you want to give them a call ahead of time, that's cool too. Uh, you can click the links above. You can friend me up. Uh, link below uh, for the winery. Check things out. And uh, we'll see everyone again next time. Thank you.